Okay, I would like now to, um, to turn to the final um, paper of our uh, meeting, um, which is to be given by uh, Professor Gordon Noble from um, Aberdeen University. Um, he um, is well known to many people um, working in um, uh, the Northern region um, and his project, the, the Northern Picts particularly, um, uh, is, is one which is shedding considerable light um, on the archaeology of the Highlands uh, for this period. Um, I do understand that this research project um, has just been um, awarded research project of the year through, through current archaeology's readers, um, and uh, obviously uh, congratulations are clearly in order for that. So I would ask uh, Gordon if you could um, share your screen, um, and uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you very much. Right, thank you very much, Colleen. That's a fantastic introduction, uh, and it means that I don't have to boast about the winning the prize myself. Um, so, thank you very much for having me come to speak to you all today. Um, and what I'll be discussing really is is an update, really, on a paper I gave um, two years ago for the uh, regional scarf, the Highland scarf, on picks in the high, Highlands. Um, so that's something I want to continue today. Um, so following on from that fantastic talk from um, Eric, a uh, brilliant uh, uh, rundown of all the fantastic evidence from, from Taradale. Um, and I'll come back to that site for later on. Um, but just really as a, as a recap, you know, we're looking at the uh, Pictish period in, in this talk um, and the Picts, as, as far as we know, um, occupied and ruled an area from roughly the 1st the 4th up to the Highlands um, and probably the Northern Isles and the Western Isles as well. Um, it's a period of developing hierarchies. We see um, the reemergence of uh, cemeteries for the dead, such as Taradale, um, really emphasizing things like uh, lineage and, and status through um, burial and burial monuments. We see the re-emergence of, of hill forts as a major monument of this uh, time period, um, and also related tra traditions such as promontory forts and, and lowland enclosures as well. Um, and we also see uh, the emergence of major field monuments as well, such as the, the symbol stones, ogham stones, uh, and the power of, of the written word really coming to the fore, uh, both on monuments and um, through things like manus manuscripts. Uh, in terms of the political organization of Pickland, um, we're really dealing with quite slim pickings. So in the Pictish King lists, uh, there's this fantastic uh, origin a myth appended to um, the, the King lists that talk about Crusny, the father of the Picts and his seven sons. And those sons include uh, ones such as Fief or Fife, uh, and Kate for uh, Kate Ness, and basically it's a claim to territory. So implying, at least by this period, that Kate Ness is, is part of uh, the Pictish uh, kingdoms. Um, and certainly in terms of the Northern Picts in the North, and we know that uh, these uh, areas were, were highly important, particularly in the earlier Pictish period, uh, with Alex Wolfe's moving of Fortru, for example, uh, the major uh, overkingship uh, to the north of the Murray Firth area. And we can see that through things like the distribution of symbol stones as well. These are very much um, focused on northern areas uh, from Aberdeenshire up to uh, uh, Caithness and, and beyond. Um, in terms of the overall narrative of the Picts in the first millennium AD, we can see major changes happening from around about the time that the Picts are first mentioned in late Roman sources as the, as the painted people. Um, and we can see big changes in the archaeological record at the same time, things like the abandonment of the roundhouse tradition, uh, abandonment of things like uh, brochs and monumental roundhouses uh, in the north. Um, and in terms of the written record, it's really um, the, the sixth century before we get the first um, secure evidence for, for kings and kingship, but presumably that perhaps went earlier. Um, and we know that the overkingship of Fortru was in operation by uh, the seventh century. 
And what we see gradually through time is, is, is a merging of different tribal and local identities uh, mentioned in, in the Iron Age to these more overarching uh, regional identities uh, from the late Roman and early medieval uh, period. Um, as I say, we're dealing with a very limited historical background. We have things like Athavan's uh, Life of Columba, uh, Bede's um, History of, of the English People, both of which uh, mention the Picts, um, but not as the main focus of these texts. Uh, we have things like uh, the Irish Annals um, to help us along as well. But these are very much uh, one-liners uh, mentioning various Pictish kings, battles within uh, Pickland, uh, and various events that uh, were of interest to um, the compilers of the annals uh, in Iona and in Ireland. <clears throat> we obviously have other sources, uh, the carved stone monuments, as so wonderfully outlined over the weekend um, in Kelly's talk and Hugh's talk and uh, Everyone else's, for that matter. Um, so uh, we've got the, the symbol stones, we've got a few um, Latin or other inscriptions, um, all of which help us piece together uh, the limited evidence we have for um, contextualizing Picts and, and Pickland. Uh, we have place names as well. Um, so we have uh, the uh, uh, pet names, for example, the pit names. Uh, which uh, go again largely from the first and fourth up to the highlands, uh, but really the, the Norse names are overlaying or perhaps removing, presumably, some of these Pictish and, and uh, earlier um, Gallic names as well, um, and gives us an idea of, of how uh, the Vikings and uh, the Norse made an impact on the highlands and the west coast in particular, uh, and places like Caithness. Um, towards the end of that first millennium AD and perhaps into the second millennium AD. Uh, in terms of the field archaeology, what do we classically look at for the Pictish period? Um, well, because of a real dearth in settlement evidence, <clears throat> we tend to reify and focus on elite settlements, forts like Burghead or Dern Dern um, and other hill forts like Clatcher Craig. Um, and very few of these identified uh, in the highlands uh, so far. Um, and also the, the field monuments like the, the symbol stones and, and the cross slabs are another favored um, territory of uh, the Pictish uh, scholar. But there is other strands of evidence really be coming to, to the fore, particularly in the last uh, uh, couple of decades. So let's look at the, the highlands in, in, in more detail and in, in focus. Um, and we take this with a pinch of salt, but if we look at Ptolemy's map, um, looking at uh, the highlands, we can see lots of different uh, tribal, tribal identities. Uh, the Kareni, Kornovi, uh, the Smerti, um, lots of different identities um, through, through uh, this, this area. Um, but by the time we get to the early medieval period, um, well, we're dealing with very few references. So it's hard to generalize, but uh, uh, Kate, Keith Ness, the headland of the cat, um, is, is the main um, name we can associate uh, with, with this earlier, uh, area. Uh, and it's quite interesting in, in the Pictish king list that the, uh, Keith, Keith Ness is the, is the son given the, the shortest reign um, for this area. Does that mean it was less important than other areas or more recently incorporated into the Pictish uh, kingdoms? Again, it's all uh, speculation to an extent, but interesting to speculate nonetheless. Uh, Sutherland, um, if we look at the, the Gallic name for Sutherland, it means among the cats. So some sort of relationship there with Keith Ness and also perhaps Shetland, uh, Isle, Isles of the Cats. Um, if we look at the limited historical evidence, uh, then uh, Athavan mentioned Brithay's court around about the Inverness area in the sixth century. So clearly important Pictish kings in uh, this Highland uh, territory in that sixth century uh, context. And as I say, that moving of Fortu into the Murray Firth area, again, puts a new focus, um, a new lens for us to examine the Highlands and the Murray Firth area uh, in, this, in this time period. <clears throat> 
again, we're dealing with very little um, historical records generally for northern Pickland and even less for northern northern Pickland, um, if you uh, get what I mean by that. Um, and certainly by the ninth century, we seem to see uh, the movement of um, Pictish power centres to the south, or certainly the historical records um, emphasising uh, um, centres in the south. And uh, again, the Viking impact must have been uh, quite extensive uh, on, on the north uh, areas, with Norse speakers as, as far as south as the Bewley Firth and Strathglass uh, in, in the east. Um, so let's look at the Highland Highland region and look at our Pictish stones. First of all, start with the with the classics, the classic uh, material evidence for this time period. Um, well, the, we find you know a good spread of these monuments through through the Highland uh, region, um, mainly concentrated on on the east coast. Uh, the famous monuments on the Tarbert Peninsula, on the Black Isle, but all the way up to to Caithness. A much sparser distribution on the west coast, um, and indeed on on uh, the, the islands, uh, a few in Sky, um, and uh, very few on the Western Isles, really, which is the same for um, early Christian uh, monuments as well. <clears throat> Don't really have time to go through all the different uh, stones found in the Highland region, but there's certainly a few interesting uh, concentrations or interesting examples. Uh, particularly in the uh, in the east coast um, area, little fairy links, for example, a uh, number of stones found there. Um, very interesting location would certainly repay uh, further uh, investigation. Uh, Bal Blair, uh, we've got one of the um, warrior or um, lone figure monuments, certainly carrying a club or whatever else weapon we might associate with that, um, and also what looks like a very um, rudimentary uh, symbol stone from Bal Blair as well, um, which uh, is very similar to some of the some of the cave decorations and on this more kind of small plaque-like stone as opposed to the, the big uh, standing stone monuments. Uh, our dross with its wolf, uh, the single animal figures uh, are quite interesting to me, uh, certainly in terms of their potential relationship and some sites uh, for sure and, um, in terms of, of forts, of Burkhead, East Lomond, etc. Uh, and Ross Keen is also a very intriguing monument as well with the metalworking tongs and the very simple step simple, uh, symbol on the back, uh, prime candidate <clears throat> for a reused uh, prehistoric uh, standing stone here. So potentially another early example. Uh, power centres, um, well, the most obvious example to, to highlight is uh, Craig Fadrick uh, overlooking uh, Inverness is this uh, Brothay's uh, fort of the of the 6th century um, at near the mouth, mouth of the, the River Ness. Uh, it's a distinct uh, possibility, um, but this is a reused Iron Age site. So what we see on the ground is largely the, the vitrified fort of uh, the Iron Age, probably 400 to 200 calibrated BC. Um, but fantastic work by um, uh, Mary Peterana and Steve Birch uh, and Forestry uh, Commission uh, led work um, on, on the fort uh, in recent years has shown uh, for sure that this was uh, uh, defended um, and uh, settled in, in the fifth, sixth century uh, context with some sort of palisade um, trench cut into the upper rampart, um, which would be something like 70, 80 meters across um, and uh, occupation in the interior shown by Alan Small's work from the 1960s as well. So um, a really interesting site potentially to, to revisit um, in, in the future. Uh, so these are some of the dates from uh, Steve Birch and, uh, and Mary's work uh, showing um, 5th, 6th century um, dated material from that Palisade Trench, but also intriguing 11th, 12th century uh, reoccupation or continued occupation uh, of the site. And more, more of these late dates are starting to pop out the, the woodwork now for these uh, fort locations. Um, 
Craig Fadrick overlooks obviously modern day Inverness. Uh, it seems highly likely to me that there was some sort of lowland complex at um, uh, or underneath modern day Inverness. So we have two uh, bull monuments um, or bovine monuments, certainly from uh, Inverness. Um, and also not too far away, the Turvain uh, silver chain uh, from, from this location. Uh, and there's a fort itself at Torvain as well. Um, so all very interesting monuments and, and suggestive of some sort of lowland uh, focus. Um, dating these monuments hard, but maybe six, 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 seventh century perhaps for these, these monuments would seem like a likely uh, date uh, to me. Um, there's another potential site uh, looking further north, one of the very few that we might associate uh, going further in, into the highlands to, to the north. Uh, and this is Dunbeath, um, which uh, Juliana Grieg has suggested is the is the Dunbeath, uh, the the dun of the of the birches uh, mentioned in the Annals of Ulster has been under siege in AD 680. That's not certain, but it's certainly a possibility. Um, an obvious context for that is some of Brithay's uh, pre or what people interpret as Brithay's pre Necton smear campaigns. Uh, so destroying the, the Orkneys, uh, deleting the Orkneys in uh, AD 682, and then the sieges at Dundurn and Dunad in AD 683, uh, prior to the battles Necht and Smear in 685. Um, so there's this a promontory fort uh, of the Pictish period <clears throat> in, in the Highland region here. And this is uh, Dunbeath Castle. And this is certainly a garden. I'd love to dig a few test bits in to um, test some of those ideas. Uh, Uckert Castle, uh, we've got part of a brooch here, Leslie Alcock and his uh, amazing campaign of excavations, uh, identified uh, Pictish era phases of occupation underneath the, the later castle. Um, seems a very likely or certain uh, early medieval power center. Um, and also a site mentioned in uh, Mathavan's uh, Life of Columba. Uh, Castle Tirum, uh, hanging basket, um, uh, uh, hanging basket, hang, hanging bowl, bowl, sorry, um, as uh, 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 highlighted to me by Daniel McLean, um, pr probably of sixth century type uh, coming from this little uh, um, islet here uh, with a later castle um, uh, under, uh, overlying. So this uh, seems another likely location for a power center. Donard Trek on Sky, uh, Ewan Mackay's excavations identified a shared of, of Eware, 7th century import from, from France. Um, and also intriguingly from uh, the same area, a, a Rhiney Man style axe hammer coming from this location as well. Very prominent uh, coastal brock, perhaps reused in the, in the Northern Isles uh, tradition. <clears throat> Um, moving to settlement sites, uh, well, this is where the Highland evidence can certainly uh, come to the fore. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, we have very few, although a growing body now of settlement evidence from the main, mainland Scotland. Um, some of the upland settlements of Pitcarmick and Lair, for example, uh, recent excavations really begin to flesh out that. But certainly the lowlands, still quite a sparse settlement record. We're talking about a few uh, handfuls, a few dozen, if you're being generous, uh, lowland uh, Pictish era uh, settlements in eastern Scotland. Um, but in the Lathran Parish in, in uh, Caithness, we've got an intriguing um, group of uh, sub, sub rectangular structures known, known as WAGs. Um, and uh, these um, were excavated, or two examples have been excavated by uh, Alexander Curl. Um, uh, in the early uh, 20th century. Um, and the, the type site is Wag of Force, um, and this is a fantastic site with wags, um, these rectangular longhouses or old buildings overlying uh, a Brock settlement here. Um, uh, this building A, um, the kind of classic example, um, but uh, Curl also identifying these uh, round structures as well, which he argued some were earlier in the Brock, so likely to be Iron Age in date, but he also suggested this structure C and D 
almost a figure of eight structure overlay a rectangular wag here, although I'm not quite so sure of that sequence uh, myself. Uh, this is a fantastic uh, drone shot that we took uh, up in De December of 2019 when we teamed up with uh, Caithness Archaeological Trust and Dunleith uh, Heritage Museum to do some exploratory work to try and see if we could, um, uh, or if there was a potential to try and get some dates for these structures um, at Wagga Force. Uh, beautiful sunlight in December 2019. This was one of the last fieldwork projects we did before lockdown. So it's got a very um, close place in my heart for a variety of different reasons. Um, so working with uh, Meg Sinclair and uh, local volunteers and a couple of our uh, students, uh, we looked at the site. This is the drone shot. Again, you can see that uh, one of the longhouses here doesn't seem that coherent compared to um, the plan. Um, drawn up by Curl, um, and you can see this uh, these two uh, roundhouses here, uh, and structure A, which is the, the structures that we focused on in our investigation. And we had very basic uh, um, research questions, um, and this is basically to see is there actually material still left at Wagga Force um, in order to try and date some of the structures. Uh, did any of the remains um, excavated by coral actually remain in situ? Uh, and was there a potential to actually sample uh, these layers for dating? So it was very much a kind of strip and map uh, exercise. So here we were, December 2019, lovely weather, um, working, uh, uncovering um, the one end of the, the rectangular building. Um, and uh, working in one, one of the roundhouses here. Uh, this is the roundhouse, uh, structure C, um, uh, interpreted as cur by Curl as one of the late structures um, overlying a rectangular um, wag, but again, I'm not so sure about that sequence. Uh, this is uh, the photograph um, from Curl's work in, uh, in the, the first half of the 20th century, showing uh, a lovely hearth here uh, with um, the walls of the structure round about. And this is what we found. Um, amazingly, it looks like Carl didn't actually really backfill anything. He clearly left it for display. Um, and uh, uh, well, in this case, there was a part of his um, a spoil heap overlying the structures. Um, but this uh, lay directly on the intact deposits from the house. So this hearth uh, you can see is the hearth shown in Curl's photograph, um, and uh, fantastically, uh, in good uh, good preservation, with some of the hearth stones actually identifiable with uh, ones on on the photograph. <clears throat> um, and this is the little plan we made, uh, showing the hearth uh, and floor la layers. Um, and we didn't excavate this again; we were just uncovering to see the potential, and we're going to. Um, create a research design and go back and sample these layers, but fantastic potential for dating these remains. Uh, this is the longhouse, uh, structure A. This is Carl's photograph looking at the end of the building, showing uh, a pier stone and capstone in situ, uh, another pier stone here and a collapsed stone lying here. And this is what we found when we excavated. You can see actually what that same um, uh, pier stone has actually fallen over here. And you can also see these two stones uh, in the foreground lying next to the hearth uh, in, in the building uh, at the end there. So this is a close up showing uh, the, the dark area here is the hearth and these stones partly collapsed over that hearth here. Uh, and then Carl identified various um, uh, floor deposits uh, in the building, um, which Either he mistook for the natural clay or they've largely been re removed. It looks like there's vestiges of those floor layers maybe in the corner, but again, we need to go back. Uh, the hearth is full of charcoal, uh, so we'll get a date for that if we can go back and sample it. Um, and this is the end of the structure we excavated. Uh, these fantastic plans drawn up by uh, Cecilia um, at uh, University of Aberdeen. Um, in terms of dating, what's my gut feeling for the dating? Uh, well, we know they are post Baroque, so they must post date the second century AD, probably. Um, and I think these could actually be really quite early. 
um, not later for Smiley AMD. If we look at the parallels, uh, sites like Dunvalin uh, in South Uist, um, got rectangular structures outside the Brock there um, that date somewhere between the second and the sixth century AD uh, in date. Um, and uh, Martin Crothers, uh, fantastic excavations up at the Cairns in Orkney, finding uh, sub rectangular building structure B1 dating from the third, fourth centuries AD. Um, and that's a structural move that we see at places like Dunnacare in the third, fourth century towards rectangular buildings. Um, perhaps influenced by Roman styles to the south, or certainly some sort of architectural change happening in that late Roman period. So it wouldn't surprise me if our um, wag structure at uh, Agaforce could date from 3rd, 4th century uh, AD uh, onwards. Um, as for the round structures, if you look at the other sequences in the Northern Isles, these tend to be uh, largely Iron Age. There's one or two, two examples, uh, and especially if you move to Shetland, you get roundhouses in later contexts. But I wonder whether the, the stratigraphical observations of Curl um, weren't quite right in this. These are uh, Iron Age indeed. Um, so all the settlement evidence, uh, including uh, from Wagga Force, has been brought together as part of the Highland Regional Scarf. Uh, uh, fantastic work by Susan Cruz and team on this. Um, and uh, really, uh, there's lots of sites beginning to come out of the woodwork now, mainly from de developer funded work. Uh, and that includes uh, hearths, uh, middens, um, corn drying, drying kilns. Uh, so there is a growing body of evidence. So I thought a lot of it is quite patchy um, in, in the lowland context. It looks like you know they're building a lot of turf structures non air fast dwellings that haven't um, withstood modern and indeed past agricultural regimes. So moving on uh, to look at the, the early church. Um, so in the traditional narrative of Northern Pickland, uh, Columba is the main uh, figure associated with the conversion of uh, the Northern Picts, um, perhaps the Northern Isles, um, but uh, really we don't know the extent of Columbus' uh, missionary activities and extent of conversion uh, in that uh, sixth century context. But certainly by the seventh century, um, all our sources give us um, no clue or no indication that uh, the Picts were in any way pagans. So it seems to be a relatively rapid uh, conversion process in that sixth, seventh century context. <clears throat> How do we evidence that? Um, again, difficult without uh, direct archaeological evidence. Things like place names uh, can contribute. So some of the, the, the kill uh, place names argued um, by Simon Taylor and others that these may reflect Columban foundations or later foundations by um, St. Curitan or Boniface. Um, and these cluster uh, in places like Skye uh, and uh, eastern uh, lowlands of uh, Easter Ross and, and uh, Sutherland. <clears throat> Obviously, if we're looking at the early um, church archaeology of, of northern Pickland, then uh, we have to uh, start off by looking at Port Mahomet, the fantastic excavations by Martin Carver and the University of York team from the 1990s through to 2007, um, and Jill Hardin's early work at the site as well, um, identifying this uh, uh, vallum enclosure, which we can really only see in these two sides. But if we imagine that this was this, the church was central to this, this could have been up to a 12 hectare enclosure, uh, which is up there, um, I think slightly larger than Iona, um, and uh, um, larger than uh, Kenedar. Also, again, none of these enclosures are fully mapped uh, as of yet. The site seems to have started off as a, an elite settlement uh, with a Barrow Cemetery um, and uh, some uh, evidence for settlement in terms of uh, round uh, structures. Um, and really taking off probably in the late 7th century and certainly in the 8th century as a major monastic settlement. 
um, and really the best excavated and best understood site of its kind <clears throat> from uh, Pickland uh, with uh, the uh, major roadway <clears throat> heading up to the church uh, and workshops and buildings on either side of this roadway, incredible density of deposits, almost an urban-like um, uh, character to the archaeology here. Um, uh, burials at the church, <clears throat> and lots of evidence for the production uh, of uh, sculpture, um, cross slabs up to four cross slabs, and also very unusual building uh, evidence as well, these uh, bag-shaped uh, or horseshoe-shaped buildings uh, found that seem to have industrial uses, kiln barns and metalworking barns um, or structures of some kind from uh, the monastic phases of, of the site. Um, fine metal working evidence, lots of evidence for uh, uh, crucibles, uh, making uh, precious church objects, but also objects for trade as well. Again, highlighting that, you know, some of these sites are, um, you know, almost urban like uh, centers of trade and, and uh, industry. Um, and if you think about the size of enclosures of these sites, 12 hectares, eight hectares, and then these were amongst the largest enclosed uh, settlements of, of the period um, across Britain and Ireland. Uh, the fantastic evidence for making uh, vellum uh, from Port Mahomet, one of the major achievements of, of the York project, uh, showing that Picts were indeed making their own uh, books. Um, we just don't have those uh, surviving, unfortunately. Um, boreal population, certainly from the monastic phase, it seems to be um, indeed a monastic settlement with uh, almost exclusively male burials. Um, and it's really only uh, from the later phases we get more mixed uh, population. And those individu individuals coming from all of their place, from Ireland, perhaps even from uh, Scandinavia. Um, but surely uh, Port Mahomet is only the tip of the iceberg. Got the, the fantastic new discovery of the Conan Stone, um, which goes together with a whole range of major cross slab monuments uh, from the Tarbert Peninsula, Rosemarkey, uh, Gulsby, um, and the nor northern um, most examples Far, Bray, Skinnet, Obster, uh, and a few across on the west uh, coast as well, um, Rasse and Applecross, among the more notable examples, but much less investment in uh, early Christian um, monuments in the West than, than in the East. Uh, and these are some examples of those monuments, um, which I won't go into uh, any detail uh, here, other than to say that they are quite a coherent group, really, generally, um, consisting of, of quite similar styles of, of decoration, uh, lots of emphasis on, on key pattern, um, not work um, and, and the like. Um, and the largest examples are uh, from uh, uh, the Tarbert Peninsula, um, Rosemarkey, fantastic example from Glenfernes uh, and, and Golsby uh, in Sutherland uh, too. And there's also some more unusual monuments, for example, the, the recumbent slab from uh, Kincardine, which shows the, the David imagery, very similar to that found at um, uh, Kineder and uh, more, more obviously on the St Andrew's sarcophagus, uh, implying royal patronage of, of some of these places like Port Mahomet and, and Kincardine. Um, looking at a couple of, of key sites, uh, just to highlight, highlight two here was Markey and uh, Applecross, sorry, three, three sites, Applecross and, and Skinnet uh, up in Caithness. Um, Rose Markey has got pretty sure bet for being one of the major, uh, if not the major church um, of um, this part of, of Northern uh, Pickland. Um, so it's associated with uh, St. Curitan uh, or Boniface as he seems to be known, of, known as as well. Uh, and Curitan is one of the guar guarantors of um, the law of the in innocents mentioned uh, as one of the um, witnesses to that in AD 697. Um, and his church seems to have been uh, at Rosemarkey, uh, which may well have been uh, the main bishopric uh, of uh, Fortru. 
Uh, and Simon Taylor has noticed, uh, noted the, the place name for Troes, um, right next to Rose Market, obviously, uh, could well be derived uh, from uh, uh, Fortru itself, um, the headland of, of Fortru, perhaps. Um, and certainly in the later medieval period, then um, uh, Rose Markey, uh, and then Fortroes was one of the bishopric sites, as was Holkirk uh, further north, and then Dornock, uh, and then the Murray, Murray Firth region, Burnie, Kinnerdern, uh, and Spiny, and Elgin seem to have uh, shared that uh, um, uh, uh, bishopric. Uh, if we look at Caithness um, from Holkirk, there's no early sculpture from Holkirk itself, but there's a really interesting, intriguing site at Skinnet, just a couple of kilometres uh, to the north of Holkirk, um, which has a, a, a nice collection of uh, sculpture, including this um, cross slab here um, and other monuments, that, uh, a font, for example. Uh, and this site is in, in open fields. It would really repay some geophysical investigation first off, um, see if this is enclosed uh, like um, some of the other uh, sites um, further south. Uh, and Apple Cross is mentioned uh, in our early sources, repeatedly mentioned, um, has been founded um, from, from Ireland, um, uh, from Bangor uh, in County Down in AD 672. Uh, and the death of abbots here are recorded through to the ninth century, suggesting this was a major site of early Christian um, uh, establishment. Um, and aerial ph photography in the, in the 60s, prior to the afforestation of that area, identified a possible curvilinear enclosure measuring around 180 by 150 meters. So a substantial enclosure, certainly not on the scale of uh, Kinedar or uh, Port Mahomet, perhaps, but uh, substantial enclosure and cur curvilinear uh, rather than uh, rectilinear, as you find at Iona and uh, some of the pic other picture sites. So that's interesting contrast there. Uh, and really interesting work by since Cynthia Thickpenny recently, uh, looking at uh, the carvings um, and the techniques of carving at uh, Apple Cross and suggesting that it was the same master craftsmen working at sites like Nig, Applecross and, and Rosemarkey. So interesting uh, indications perhaps of some of the organization of church and um, the arts and crafts that uh, were um, patronized by the church and by elites. Um, there are undoubtedly uh, smaller church sites as well. Congash and in Inverness sure seems like a, a good bet for that. Um, uh, stone-walled enclosure surrounded by crop marks of a rectilinear enclosure um, and within that uh, site is the uh, evidence for a probable early chapel and the, the, the uh, Gaelic name for the site, uh, Park and Capel, suggests there's a chapel site as well. Uh, interestingly, there's two picture stones at the entranceway to the enclosure. Is that the original position or is this uh, later reuse of those? Uh, and also um, the early Christian stone uh, coming from near that entranceway. Uh, again, um, backing up that this is an early chapel site of, of some uh, description. Another one, another site that really repay further field work. Um, and then uh, finally looking at uh, evidence for death and burial. Um, so uh, Eric's talk already um, dealt with uh, Taradale, but just to note, this is one of many cemeteries across Northern Pickland, most of them identified uh, by crop marks. Um, and Julia Mitchell has brought together all this evidence in our, in our recent PhD, which is a work of art in itself. Um, and further north and west, we do have a few upstanding examples of these cemeteries. Uh, and undoubtedly, there's more waiting to be discovered. Um, so these were first identified um, from the early 20th century excavations at Ackergill, but really, really on, only understood as a category of evidence from the 1970s, 1980s uh, onwards. Uh, these cover um, single and at times multiple burials. Uh, these um, Lonkis graves or dug graves, usually West East burials. Um, and you find these in small cemeteries. Uh, up to uh, large cemeteries like Taradale, 
or cloth gown that can have up to 30, 30 odd barrels in them. Um, some are associated with symbol stones. Um, uh, this has been questioned at times, but I don't think um, there's any way to discount some of this evidence. Uh, so Dun Robin, uh, the stone found by ploughing and directly below um, the fine spot was this uh, square or, or sub-rectangular cairn. Uh, and we have recently dated this burial through a high precision date to 575 to 65 AD. So late 6th, earliest uh, 7th century uh, in date. <clears throat> Acker Gill, early excavations. Um, Juliet is looking at this again, redating uh, some of the human remains from here. So that's uh, all yet to come out. Um, but the early excavations was by Edwards in the 1920s. Uh, Anna Ritchie's brought this together in a fantastic paper from 2011. Um, similar to the cemetery at the London Lynx uh, and uh, three symbol stones from, from the area, non directly associated with monuments. Uh, so, so some of these stones might be marking the burial ground rather than individuals uh, here. Um, so we're waiting on the dates of this site. Uh, Garbeg, another uh, fantastic site that's upstanding. Um, 26 monuments, and uh, you can see some of the characteristics of some of these cemeteries, the conjoining of barrows, almost creating lineages or relationships of the dead. Uh, and these 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 rows uh, created uh, uh, for these monuments, and also a symbol stone or part of a symbol stone found in association one of, one of these cairns here as well. Taradale, what more can I say after Eric's fantastic presentation? Uh, this is definitely one of the most impressive cemeteries, and it tends to be the larger cemeteries that you find these more unusual associated monuments, the square enclosures. Uh, so we've got examples at Rhiney uh, and at Fortiviate, both sites with um, uh, uh, associations with elites and, and royal associations. Um, but actually the largest cemetery known uh, so far uh, in the whole of Pickland, um, I think that's right, uh, Juliet will correct me, uh, is Croft Gowan, um, which is located very close to uh, Dunaxton. Uh, one of the possible sites of the Battle of Nectansmere, uh, with this really interesting um, and unusual symbol stone from Dunacton. Uh, and just overlooking Croft Gowing Cemetery uh, is uh, this fantastic Nosas discovery, uh, Toralvi uh, Fort. Um, and this is a site we were meant to be uh, testing uh, in um, April, I think it was, <laughs> or March, can't forget, uh, remember now. Uh, and lockdown put uh, paid to that. So hopefully we'll be back there very soon. Um, and then finally, just you know, to highlight that these uh, monumental cemeteries were not the only uh, context in which people were, were buried or disposed of. Um, uh, Steve Birch and Noasas's work um, at uh, uh, Rosemarkey Caves, uh, finding Rosemarkey Man, uh, this very unusual burial in this uh, splayed position uh, with animal bones uh, laid round about and metal working from the cave. So very unusual uh, context. It's reminiscent of some of the um, burials from cow seed in the earlier date in the third or fourth century um, AD in that context, <clears throat> which uh, where the individuals have been uh, decapitated. So just really to, to end, um, you know, um, what kind of sites could we investigate further in the Highlands uh, in uh, looking at the Pictish period? Um, well, forts, uh, revisiting revis Craig Fadrig, um, looking at some of these promontory forts like Dunbeef would be really interesting to see if we can begin to uh, put some dots on the map in terms of uh, likely elite centres. Uh, in this uh, northern uh, context. Um, understand more about the early medieval occupation of hill forts. So Craig Fadrig uh, never published um, and not, not fully dated in terms of the interior deposits. This would be uh, a site that we've often thought about revisiting in terms of uh, opening the sections left by Alan Small in the center and trying to get better chronology uh, for the site. Uh, date the major settlement transitions. So hopefully Wagga Force will help us in terms of looking at the uh, character of settlement in uh, the kind of post roundhouse and post Brock uh, context. 
uh, understand some of these cemeteries. So that's where some of Juliet's work has been great in terms of uh, redating uh, from archive samples. And of course, it'll be uh, wonderful to hear uh, what we can learn more about Taradell through, through the dating uh, uh, process there. And finally, I haven't mentioned Vikings of the North very much. Uh, Colleen will be um, probably delighted to, to, to hear because I probably butcher it. Um, but uh, sites that document the Norse transition would be very interesting uh, to look at as well. Ray, for example, is a location of a possible Viking cemetery uh, and also um, an area with uh, clear Pictish and early Christian activity as well. Um, Fresic links as well would be another obvious uh, target. Um, but that's a whole other talk and one that Colleen would be uh, and others would be much better at dealing with. So finally, um, when you can support your uh, Highland Museum, Starbuck Discovery Centre, Grome House, um, Dunbeath Heritage Trust, uh, um, all the little museums need our support, especially at this time. And uh, finally, I have to get some sort of plug in. Um, we have a book about our project, The King of the North. Uh, you might want to buy it. Uh, all, proceed, all proceeds um, go to uh, the Tarbert uh, Discovery Center. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Gordon. That was great. That was a really, a really useful uh, contextualization of um, all uh, current work that's been undertaken, and you and your guys have been um, adding so much to the uh, to the archaeological record. It's really, um, it's really very, very informative to see all that. Um, we we have a um, just a. a, a couple of questions so far, um, but I'm certainly um, sure that there will be very many of these. So um, there was a question, there has been a question from Roxanne um, and uh, it's followed with several other people who want to have an answer to this or a, a discussion of it. Um, so is why is there such a dearth of settlement evidence for the Picts, such so a settlement evidence? Were the areas where they placed their homes so reused later that they've disappeared? Um, I think it's just a question of survival, really. Um, even in the Northern Isles, where you see uh, better preservation with some of the stone structures, you can see they're using uh, things like single, single um, skin walls. So it kind of implies they're also using turf, even uh, in an area with good stone sources. Uh, so it looks like um, they're moving um, uh, two different forms of building the structure, so turf walls, truck frames, and just the, the potential for those to survive is, is, is very poor. Uh, so it's only where you have exceptional survival. So Dunnock here, it's because it's a, a sea stack and, you know, um, people hadn't cultivated there in an intensive way. Although even there it had been um, cultivated by a fisherman in the 19th century. Um, and in Burghead, where our structures are um, surviving under um, almost a meter of, of sand in 19th century overburden um, and there are thin layers that, you know, they're less than, um, you know, 0.1 of a meter uh, in terms of, of thickness. So you can imagine if that's plowed uh, even once, then it removes all traces. So it's really only in the uplands um, and in more unusual survival conditions that we're going to get those buildings. But again, highlands is a good potential in terms of the lesser, um, use of arable agriculture in, in some areas, although Taradil is an obvious uh, uh, exception um, to that. So yeah, lots more to do. Um, we're certainly beginning to flesh out the settlement record, um, but we're still light years away from you know, Ireland or Anglo-Saxon England in terms of a uh, number of uh, structures. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, the major uh, changes in, in view has been that, you know, you don't necessarily, rectangular buildings, for example, don't necessarily have to be Viking. Um, and, you know, uh, it's keeping an open mind about all this, um, uh, which helps us move forward. And I think that's really, really important. Um, so there's a, um, a question from um, Anne McInnes. Um, and several others, um, same thing. Do you have any thoughts as to where the Conan stone fits into this picture of Northern Pictland? That's a 50, 50 million dollar question. Um, no, <laughs> this is the short answer. Long answer, uh, carry on. <laughs> um, no, it's uh, no, it's fantastic find, isn't it? And uh, it'd be great to follow that up with more work looking at the um, 
landscape around around the fine spot you know is there any sort of enclosure around that site um what more can be found who, who knows really it's very very exciting um i think uh you know pictish archaeology is in such a dynamic phase just now that you know our world is our oyster really it's kind of limited by funding as as always but um you know there's so many projects out there and uh we've gone from a a phase where it was very difficult to you know identify new avenues for um research um but uh there's lots of potential lots of challenges i mean i think you know with our northern picks work you know we probably we've we've sampled lots of sites for example hill forts and maybe one in ten of those hill forts might be of this period um so the sites are still limited to an extent um, but we just could be ambitious and try and do more in the way of field work and new sites will pop up i'm sure question from uh, trevor wiley who says do you have any thoughts for a wider for a wider context on why trusty's hill symbol stone is such a geographic outlier um not personally but my phd student zach kinkley is looking at uh early medieval uh so-called nuclear forts um including some of the examples done in dumfries and galway just looking at that um, as, a, a, as a site type um, across um, Britonic areas, um, uh, uh, Scottish areas and uh, Pictish areas as well, and trying to uh, get more of a handle on, on the, the context of those uh, particular forts. And uh, that will help contextualize, I think, things like a trusty hills, as well as obviously the uh, great work that uh, Ron Toulis and Chris uh, Bowles did um, a few years back. Mm -hmm. And the question from Helen, um, uh, asking you, um, do you, do you now have plans to look at that big island Dunglass opposite the Conan Stone as a potential site of interest? Well, I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't like to step on any toes there. Um, I'm not sure what Nosas's plans uh, uh, are for the area. Um, I'd certainly, you know, be happy to advise or, or help out uh, uh, where, where I can. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think actually that's probably the, the correct answer because I do genuinely think that the the, the combination of professional and um, and um, community or local archaeologists um, is definitely the way for I personally feel anyway definitely the way forward. So um, yeah, so I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Um, there was um, a question from Elizabeth Johnson who says, "So where are the Perthshire Pictish settlement sites then?" <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Persia actually has the, the, some of the very few that we have. Well, yeah. the most we have in terms of the upland settlements, the Picarmic style houses, which I think there's maybe 40 or 50 yeah. odd um, uh, identified by the Royal Commission Survey and a few uh, subsequently. Um, so that's actually our best settlement evidence is the uplands of Persia. And really what I might term, you know, outer Pickland in terms of, you know, the Northern Isles settlements and the Western Isles um, in terms of, you know, our dated settlements uh, from that time period. Um, so really that's where we, where we take our mark and where we take our challenge in terms of identifying them in other places like uh, in other parts of the Highlands and, and the Lowlands too. Um, so, Elizabeth, if you haven't checked out, there's uh, the Lair volume, uh, Glen Shee volume, which is uh, downloadable for free, um, Davy Strachan uh, and Richard Tipping, and it's a fantastic volume, so check that out. That's great. And, uh, and a question from, from Roxanne saying about houses being fairly ephemeral. Um, might the main Pictish population have been semi-nomadic, so some are transhumans, for example, uh, and moved around the landscapes using shielings, etc., uh, with churches. Sorry, somebody's just lost that. Um, sorry, with churches and central or elite power centres being stone built and therefore more visible for us, if they're surviving better. Yeah, absolutely, it is a, it is a survival issue to an extent. Um, but even even at elite centres like Burghead, they look, you know, they are. Some of the buildings look like they're stone walled, but some are definitely turf. Um, so it's not just a matter of status, I don't think. Um, but uh, in terms of you know semi nomadic, um, possibly. I mean, some of the karmic buildings have been suggested to be shielings, but the actual evidence suggests that they are mixed farming settlements in in a climatic um, time period in which it was uh, much more able to settle some of these upland locations. Uh, mm -hmm. 
not to say that some of the other smaller pit karmic uh, buildings might be shielings, but no direct evidence of that as of yet. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if there is some sort of uh, shielding type system going on in the early medieval period. Uh, in the lowlands, um, then, uh, you know, we, we do have evidence where where it survives that these these dwellings and these sites stayed in occupation for centuries at, at a time. So there does seem to be permanent pep, uh, population nodes, but again, it's just the difficulty of, of finding them really. Okay, and I'm just going to take this one as the last um, the last one, which is basically from uh, from uh, Kathy Wrench, who sh says that you mentioned vellum making at Port Mahomac. Mm -hmm. Is there any other is there any other evidence of a written Pictish language? <laughs> So you've got two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> two seconds. Uh, well, I'm not the person to ask for these. Um, no. Like Catherine Forsyth, uh, Hughes, a great talk this morning. Um, uh, well, obviously, you know, the, the most likely interpretation of the picture symbols is it's some sort of naming tradition. So it's, you know, um, developing from, you know, a, a written or spoken, spoken language and representing a very limited, very, very limited element of that on stone. That's uh, if, if we believe them. What seems like the most likely interpretation. Um, they're writing uh, in other forms through Ogham and, and Latin inscriptions as well. So that you know the highly literate cultures. We just don't have any of the manus manuscripts surviving uh, from that uh, time period, um, unfortunately. No, that's it. Is a very big question. That um, uh, thank you for that. Um, I think um, we should uh, just uh, um, call an end to this uh, questioning just now. Um, and um, I would um, ask um, everybody to notionally thank you for that. Um, and I would just like to say just a few words um, to, um, to bring our proceedings, uh, our formal proceedings um, to a close.